My name is Terry Cooper. I'm the director of the Center for Organization Health and Wellbeing at Lancaster University. My bit is on well-being at work, and uh, as we all know, in Westminster, we're nine-to-fivers with at least an hour or two off for lunch every day, aren't we? Huh? We're all very laid back. Uh, if we take a look at the changing nature of work over the last 10 or 15 years, maybe over 20 years in the UK, uh, we see that jobs are less secure than ever before, they're longer hours, uh, they're, people are much more overloaded, we have le less uh, work-life balance. In other words, my books are doing remarkably well. In other words, what we have now is increasing stress levels in the workplace, and you can take a look at some of the costs, and these are very conservative costs, incidentally. Uh, the cost of workplace stress is amounting to 10 to 14 million lost working days every year, amounting to three quarters of a billion. The Sainsbury Center for Mental Health says it's five times that level. Presenteeism, which I think is a real problem area, which is difficult to measure, but nevertheless we have had economists measure this for us, which is people turning up to work but who are stressed, frightened of not turning up to work, but who don't give added value to products and services, which is an enormous kind of cost. Again, the Sainsbury Center says it's four or five times these figures. And then the cost of premature retirement. And the most probably important cost for us is the incapacity benefit, which is amounting in the UK to 12 to 13 billion a year, of which the single biggest source of it is for mental health and stress at work. It represents 40% of the 12 billion a year, which means it's, it's a cost of 5 billion. So it's a pretty costly business. And so it's, a, it's an area of work we have to do, and it is changing quite dramatically. The report, we look at a whole range of ideas. Uh, I think the most important, well, getting on from what John said, given the job insecurity that we're seeing more of, and the likelihood that organizations are going to employ less people who are going to do more work, it's incredibly important. Jobs are no longer going to be for life. They're already no longer for life. So what we have to do is train, retrain, and ensure that we encourage people to do as much training as possible to develop the skills so that they're more employable. So that's really important. I think one of the major findings, remember this is science-based, one of the most important findings is how you are managed can damage your health. Managers, if you think about it, the science on it tells us if people have no control at work, no autonomy, if they're managed by fault-finding rather than by praise and reward, if they're overloaded by work, if, they, if the manager creates a long working hours culture, that will make people ill. And it's very interesting. I'm in a major business school, and lots of business schools teach people marketing, human resource management. What they don't teach them is the skills of how to manage human beings, the social and interpersonal skills. These are extremely important. In the report, we talk about the Train to Gain program in, in the uh, uh, in the Learning and Skills Council should be extended to give managerial training, which will help employers because it's a, it's a co-partnership, to develop social and interpersonal skills. I think it's really fundamental uh, in this arena. So line managers. Also, we also think that another interesting dimension is if you look at an annual report of a company, you'll see the profits, you'll see the overall earnings and everything else. But what you don't see is what do they do about people? They t you hear in industry a lot, the most valuable resource we have is our human resource. Why in, shouldn't we have in annual reports information about sickness absence, about job satisfaction among employees, as a KPI, as a key performance indicator? And we think managers as well should have that. And there are ways of incentivizing businesses to think about that. Let's reduce our sickness absence rate from 5.2% to 4.3% next year. Let's have that as a part of our business because the evidence is healthier employees mean much more productive employees. Another area that we're interested in is flexible working arrangements. Uh, the evidence, um, yeah, I see smiles. The evidence is that, um, that flexible work, if people choose flexible working arrangements, they will be more job satisfied, they will be healthier, and more productive. This is not a soft issue. This is a real live bottom line issue. And the uh, economists have done a cost benefit analysis on our ideas that maybe we should have flexible working arrangements, not just for people with kids, but why not elder care? If in 20 and 30 years people are going to live longer, they're going to have to look after elderly parents. So why don't we have flexible working arrangements for all? The cost-benefit analysis done by our economists showed that the three to seven times, of, for every pound we invest, we'll either get back three or seven pounds back on a flexible working arrangement scheme. So we think that's an important area. Another one is primary care. When people are stressed by work, they go to their GP. 
GP sees them. GP doesn't know how to deal with it. It's a work-related issue. They're being bullied at work. Their careers are blocked. Whatever the issue at work is. And what we think is important, I think we see it in lots of areas, and, and Rachel's just mentioned it as well in mental health generally, that the first port of call for most people who get ill is their GP. Well, GPs don't know how to deal with work-related problems. They should have occupational health advisors there right away that an individual is sent to, just like they should do for social issues as well. So we have to kind of rethink, I think, how we do primary care. Just an idea that we have about how we should do it. Another thing uh, that we've come up with is just the idea that maybe we ought to be doing, and the major companies and public sector bodies in the UK are already doing it. The really good employers are doing well-being and stress audits to find out if there's a problem, where it is and what it is before it gets too bad. So it's early identification and then doing something about problems. Just like you go to your GP and a GP would do a diagnosis, take blood and everything else, why aren't we finding out what's going on in the work environment before it gets too late? and we have people going off ill on incapacity benefits. And let me just finish by a quote that was written, I think there's a really interesting one, by a really eminent social anthropologist, a guy called Studs Terkel. He wrote a book in, in, uh, in the 1970s called Working. It's a world-acclaimed book. And it, uh, what he did is he went to the United States and interviewed thousands of people about their job. That was what the whole book was about. What do you think about your job? What makes you so... Uh, happy what, what uh, causes you trouble. And what I like is what he says in the conclusion of the book. He says, work is, is about a search for daily meaning as well as daily bread, for recognition as well as cash, for astonishment rather than torpor, in short, for a sort of life rather than a Monday through Friday sort of dying. And I think that's our goal. Thank you very much.